Seeger on Little Boxes. And we'll try it. So give a listen to this song. Try to listen to the words.
lost me with a bunch of those slogans and stuff, that's good. You're not missing anything. But it looks at that and it says, you are this influential on a scale of one to a hundred. And anyone who really looks at that and says, it's not influential, it's how important am I? How, how valuable am I? How worthwhile am I? Do I have enough friends that I can be considered important? And do I have enough people talking about me that I can consider myself valuable? Someone who has something to offer. Do I have enough of a presence? Am I popular enough to say I'm living a full life? This mentality starts in elementary school sometimes, rears its head in junior high, high school, and continues in these moments when we look back at ourselves and we say, I just don't have any friends, I'm not that popular, nobody cares about me, I have nothing to offer. I'm not living a full life. Where are your relationships? What do you hold to be most valuable? In this letter to the Colossian community, it's written to people who are trying to understand what it means to be in a relationship with Christ, but they're also being pulled away, being seduced away to these other kinds of ideas, these other philosophies, these other religious traditions, these other kinds of relationships with other ways of being. And it's confusing them, it's, it's misguiding them, and it's splitting the community. And I wonder about that with us. I had a friend who recently got a, a new TV. It's one of those big ones with the curved screen, the partly curved screen. I don't know what that means. Um, I try not to learn about technology because then I just look at my tiny little TV and say, well, here we are, still in 1984. <laughs> uh, no, it doesn't have vacuum tubes anymore. It's not that old. But it, my friend was showing me his TV and he said, I want you to see this. And, and he had such an excitement about it. Come here and see this new thing I got. Come here and see this TV. And he showed me and he had brought out a rack and dusted off the top. Uh, and he made sure everything was set all around it. And he's one when we walked into the room, he said, you got to walk with a little bit of a hushed awe. <laughs> Have you ever gone to see a baby for the first time? And you walk in the room with a hushed awe, and the person is so excited to show their child, you know, like the baby <laughs> over here. And, and everyone, it, it was similar to that. And my friend was treating his television. This was his baby. And he had a relationship with that TV. He really did. He fed it. He spoke to it. And that TV gave him things back. And that relationship was a sign of being successful. Those relationships. How often are we encouraged to have a relationship with our profession at the expense of our family? Your family will always be there, but this job, this project, this demand, really you need to give a little extra time, you need to give more hours, and don't worry, your family will be fine. How often are we encouraged to have a relationship with something that's tangible, with something that's materialistic over other people, other humans? And how often are we encouraged to have relationships with people that are fleeting, that do not have depth, that are just purely physical? or purely to use that other person, and that's how we're supposed to live, these relationships that are often harmful. And let's not even think about those relationships that involve a substance abuse, those relationships where that, that thing, that fix, that feeling becomes the most important thing in your life. And a full life is deemed worthy by the relationships we have. Are we living according to the script that was given to us by our parents? Are we living according to the script that's given to us by our popular culture? Are we living according to the scripts that were given to us by our friends? Yet today, I was driving up here because I live in the Potawatomi area. I, I was pulling out on the post road and I saw no less than 20 Corvettes driving the opposite way. At least 20 Corvettes. They look beautiful. I, I don't know cars that well. I only knew they were Corvettes because by the third one, I'm like, there's something similar about those cars. And they were nice, they were all clean and shiny, and then I realized there's a Corvette show that got in the park today. So that's where you can go after church, check out the Corvettes. And people look really proud of their cars. 
You could tell. These weren't cars that they carted children around to soccer matches and such. These weren't cars to just get from A to B. These were something they really cared about. And, and it's not that there's anything wrong with that. It's good to have things that you love, things that bring you joy. But what happens when that becomes the most important relationship in your life? What happens when that thing, or that job, or whatever it is that's fleeting becomes the most important relationship in your life? And scripture from this gospel reminds us, Christ reminds us that where our treasures are, there our heart is also. I feel like the church, the churches have fallen into this trap of looking at relationships of letting relationships be the most important thing. And, and at first blush, we may say, that's fine, that makes sense, but what is it that we care most about? How many churches really value the organ and the relationship with their organ? No offense, not it's a beautiful organ. <laughs> but is that the most important thing? Or how many churches really value their technological savvy? the website, and they are at a Twitter account or anything like that, and that's how they really know that they're doing a good job, is how good that is. How many churches really value just what the building looks like, and their relationship with their building, or their relationship with the hymnals, and if you say, we don't have a strong one like that, try changing the hymnals and see what happens. Those relationships of things within our church life can often clutter up what is supposed to be most important. Those relationships with ideas in our head of what it means to be a successful church can often get in the way of what it is that we really need to be focused on. I've heard too many stories of pastors, young upstart pastors. I'm not a young upstart anymore, so I, I can now talk about them in, in a disparaging way. Of young upstart pastors going to churches and saying, we just need to throw out the organ, bring in a band, put up the screen, and have that kind of service. Have a praise service, have a contemporary service. Have a service that will bring in people. And even if there's only 15 people in the pews, they have a relationship with an idea of a worship service over a relationship with the people who are there. This idea of success, of what important relationships might be, clutter up our lives. Life. A successful life. A happy life. We start with that relationship with God. We know it through Christ. We started with this song, pretty, you know, Little Boxes. I humbly tried to rewrite a little bit. Look at Jesus on the hillside. Look at Jesus calling you and me. Look at Jesus on the hillside. Calling us to live with him. Into God's arms, as God's people, we are called to live and grow. As God's church, as God's gathering, we're called to be the Lord's. And we give ourselves fully to God. We make God begin the center of our life, of our relationships, as known to Christ. Amen. God in our quiet time reading scripture, that's pretty good. But we don't see God fully until we see Christ. And that's what the passage says, that in, in Christ, God dwells fully. And if you want a relationship with God, and if you want a relationship with God that's different than anywhere else, that's different than any other relationship you can find, then it has to be through Christ. The relationship that we find with God through Christ is unique. Think about that statement. That's a strong statement. The word unique is a word that's used too much and misused. I've asked Randy today, what's wrong with the sentence? If I said this worship service is very unique, what's wrong with that sentence? Something can be very unique, either it is or it isn't. That relationship with God through Christ is unique. It stands alone. It is different because God is not revealed in that fullness any other way. And the relationship that we have with God through Christ is something that feeds us, that fills us, that gives us hope, that gives us promise, that helps us remember that we are loved, we are forgiven, we are redeemed. 
In Christ, we see what forgiveness is. In Christ, we see what mercy is. In Christ, we see what justice is. We see what righteousness is. We see what compassion is. In Christ, we see who God is fully. And if we want to live a full life, if we want to live a life that is deep and fulfilling and successful and profound, then it needs to start with that right kind of relationship, and that's a relationship with God through Christ. Relationship with God through Christ. That's a hard thing to ask of ourselves. Because there are times when our desires are split. There are times when we want to give it all to Christ, but there's something over here that also pulls us astray. If I was a car fanatic, which again I'm not, but if I was and I was driving up here to get ready and I passed by the 19th and the 20th Corvette, I tell you, I would probably want to turn around and go check out what was going on there. I know that worship's important. I know that, you know, I've got a word to proclaim, but boy, those cars were really nice. Really pretty cars. I don't know if you're supposed to call a Corvette pretty. Is that okay? And you have this pull. And we all have that pull. We all have that, that pull that, that divides our allegiance to Christ. But again and again, we're called to make that commitment, that full commitment, to say, I want to give myself fully to you. I want your relationship to be the foundation, to be the beginning, to be the bedrock of all other relationships that I have. I promise you, if all of your relationships fall out of your relationship with God, then you will be okay. If all other relationships fall out of your relationship with God, you will be okay. You'll be more than okay. You'll be blessed. Think about it. Think about a work that you have, a calling, a profession that you embrace, but you say it's a ministry in which I live out my relationship with God. Think about a relationship you have, a marriage that you might have, or even something that might become, or something like that, and you say, this relationship, this connection, this love that I have for this other person comes out of my love for God. Think even about a hobby that you might have. Some, because we need hobbies, otherwise we go crazy. But that hobby you have, you say, this hobby, this time that I give myself, this time to replenish myself comes out of my love for God. And if it doesn't feel right, if it feels like there's dissonance, if there feels like there's a clash, then maybe you should walk away. Okay, right. that's my best advice to you. <laughs> Colossians remind us what's most important. It's the relationship with God. The relationship with God is most important. And, and we say that. You know, it, it, it almost becomes something that we'll say, like, well, God first and everything else. But do we really ever step back and think about it? Do we ever step back and think, where is God in my life? Where is God in, in, with, along with everything else? If you were to take a backpack and put your life into it and put in all the other demands and the hobbies and the expectations and fill it up and then put God in, would there be room for God? Or do you put God in first? That's the bottom, that's the foundation, that's the base. That Colossians passage is reminding us all these other philosophies, all these other worldly ideas, all these other seductions just pull us away from that relationship which is most important for that full life, that relationship with God. But how do we know God? How do we know God fully? I talked with the kids about this, and I, maybe they got the point, I don't know. But we can see aspects of God in nature. We see aspects of God in what people do. We see aspects of God in those quiet times, in those hymns. We see aspects of God here and there, but we never see God fully. Think of it if I did impersonations, which I won't, I promise. But if I was to come here and to do a, a, a Frank Sinatra impersonation, if I really practiced, if I really tried it, and I think that blue contacts, you might say, that's pretty close. 
But for those of you who have seen Frank Sinatra live, you say you're still far. So if I could come in here and do an Elvis impersonation, and I could, hey, you know, select the hair back, get the pompadour, wear the pants, do the, the pelvic thing, I won't. And I could get a little wiggle on the voice just right, and you say, that, that, that's pretty good. But for those of you who have seen Elvis live, they say you're still far. 